Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Lorga. For years I have despised Lorga. Look at your Primarch, Honorius. So singular in aspect. So noble. I have envied you, envied the Imperial Fists, the Lunar Wolves, the Iron Hands. And I am not alone. We struggle with a mercurial mind, Honorius. We labor under the burden of a brilliant but fallible commander. We no longer bear the word, my friend. We bear Lorga. The difference between gods and demons largely depends upon where one is standing at the time. All I ever wanted was the truth. The human incarnation of did nothing wrong. Lorga, also known as Lorga Aurelian, bearer of the word, the Eurizen, CF. William Blake, the Golden One, the goddamned choir boy, Hamburger, and, if you're Conrad Kurz, pathetic, is the Primarch of the Word Bearer's Legion, the extra-religious legion of Kiosk Fis Marines. He is credited within 40k fluff for being the first Primarch to fall to the ruinous powers. Yes, we know what you're thinking and no, Horus was just the most powerful Primarch to lead the actual rebellion and the first to be public about it. Lorga was the first to be corrupted, though this wasn't noticed as he was very secretive about it. Also, looks just like Patrick Stewart, and handsome Squidward. Pre-heresy. Like the rest of the Primarchs, Lorga was scattered through the warp by the Chaos Gods. The infant landed on Colchis, a world of excellence, beauty and most of all, faith. Lorga was taken in by Kor Farron, a former priest of the Covenant, Colchis chief religious order, and a Chaos worshipper. As he grew, he was educated in philosophy and rhetoric and he was gifted with a charisma that greatly aided his role as a preacher, making him immensely popular with the cultish and faithful. At first, he remained a staunch defender of the faith, but his life changed due to his frequent visions of a new messiah arriving into Colchis, clad in gleaming armor, who rode on clouds of iron as he led his army of angels across the stars. Though Corferon had little patience or what he considered heresy, his own grudges with the Covenant meant that when they declared war on Lorga and all his followers Corferon would aid his son, and continue to give lip service to the Emperor until the time was right. Six long years engulfed Colchis into civil war, yet, due to his insane charisma convincing thousands upon thousands of faithful to worship the new messiah, Lorga won through sheer numbers. By the time they were done, the Emperor of Mankind and Magnus the Red arrived on Colchis and everybody was absolutely ecstatic. Almost overnight Colchis became an extravagant world all in devotion to the Emperor. After about a month of celebrations, the now slightly annoyed Emperor appointed Lorga head of the Imperial Heralds, which Lorga renamed the Word Bearers. During the Great Crusade, Lorga loved the Emperor. Like really loved him, we are talking about Yandir levels. So you bet where this is all going to be, in fact, he was the only Primarch to both consider him a god and actively spread said belief wherever he went. He loved the Emperor so much that he wrote the Lictitio Divinitatus which was all about the divinity of the Emperor, and built huge gothic cathedrals on every single world the word bearers conquered. And, ironically enough for a being genetically engineered to be a super soldier and general, he disliked war. To say his generally preachy attitude didn't endear him to his brothers is an understatement. Except for Horus, Lemon Russ and Magnus, Lorga had little friends or support amongst his brothers. Gideman respected the fact he rebuilt planets after conquering them but they were never really close and he would become something of a pal with Angron during the heresy, as much as can be said that Angron could be. Comma this is best demonstrated by the following example. At one point the word bearers had come to the help of the Iron Hands, so Ferris Manus decided to craft a nice weapon for Lorga as a thank you gift. Lorga was actually happy but as he watched Manus busy at his forge, he couldn't help to wonder, aloud, whether his brother would be able to craft anything beside tools for war with his metal hands. Manus didn't really appreciate the comment and wondered back if Lorga would able to craft anything at all. Pharaoh still gave him a luminarum and Lorga would wield the huge Crozius Arcanum from then on, but the incident only broadened the wedge between them. Unbeknownst to Lorga, 
The emperor was a analyst and was really disappointed towards his son but waited 100 years before telling by having the Smurfs destroy Lorgo's greatest masterpiece city, Menachia, like any good bad daddy would have done it. It's like he was begging Lorgo to fall to chaos. Lorgo's religiosity threatened to undermine his top secret project to starve chaos of any kind of worship. He made Lorgo stop his god worship in a very good daddy kind of way. He then used his sicker powers to force Lorgar and 100,000 of his legion to kneel before the Emperor, rob out Gilliman, and Malkada the Sigilite. Destroying an entire city is one thing, but being forced to kneel down before Great Grandpa Smurf was of such a humiliation that it would inflict clinically incurable depression into anyone. Which is totally understandable as the Emperor had waited a whole century to tell that he was not at all into this being worshipped as a god thing Lorga kept preaching about all the time, only to have the Ultramarines destroy the city Lorga considered one of his greatest achievements to make his point. Again, this was 100 years after Lorga's discovery by Big E, and Lorga rightfully pointed out to Magnus that the Emperor had spent weeks on Colchis following his arrival and had witnessed that people were clearly worshipping him as a god yet had said nothing then, only to tell Lorgar a century later that he was a failure and should shape up, see the first heretic. What is even more mind-boggling is that, despite this fact, it neither occurred to the Emperor nor Magnus, who are both supposed to be hyper-geniuses, that it probably would have been the sensible thing to tell Lorgar right then and there that religion was not really the Emperor's thing. Instead of waiting a whole century before letting Lorgar know that he had messed up, the Emperor even went so far as to tell Lorga that out of all of his sons Lorga, and Lorga alone, had failed him. Again, after 100 years, making his bitterness and eventual fall of chaos much more understandable. Considering such, the Emperor could not have reacted worse, severe enough to embitter Lorga but without any attempt to rehabilitate the inevitable festering wound. A fact that apparently Malkada eventually realized at some point as in the audio drama he says if there is one Primarch I wish we could have saved, I would have hoped it to be Lorga, not exact quote, but close. Gilliman had similar reservations. He never acted on them until too late, probably because Lorga had not even been super excited about what he saw in the warp and called it horror. But under the gentle guidance of Corferon and, fuck, Erebus, the two eventually managed to corrupt him. Severely humiliated and racked with self-doubt, Lorga secluded himself in emo sulking, and began listening to Corfaron, now first captain of the word bearers, and first chaplain Erebus about the facts of the old faith of Colchis. Many other worlds shared similar concepts of such gods. Having unrelated worlds share a single common faith, is this evidence that such gods beyond the realm of material existence truly existed and were worthy of worship? This in turn led to Lorga, willing to expand his enlightenment and guided by the sorcerer Injithal the ascended of the planet Cardia, plunging headfirst into the eye of terror. The rest is history heresy. Before the heresy Lorga was widely considered the weakest primarch as both a fighter and warlord, preferring to act more as a diplomat and preacher. His actions during the heresy proved everyone wrong, or maybe his power grew massively once he tapped into his psychic powers he nearly got shredded by Corvus during the dropsite massacre. When Lorga first toured the Isle of Terror, he was forced to fight Angroth the Unbound, who is to bloodthirsters what bloodthirsters are to Gretchen, in order to prove himself worthy of becoming the champion of Chaos Undivided, and won. He also got a visit from Keris Facheva, informing him of his possible futures in a one-time deal where that Lord of Change would only speak the truth, primarily involving his future campaign on Kalth, and a very important choice to make. His plan of attack shooting of his allies in the back on Kalth resulted in beating the shit out of ultramarine forces two times his army's size, proving Logu was also a damn good warlord. Even the fact that his Kalth attack force was finally screwed over was part of his plan. The entire point of the Kalth war was to purge the legion of ignorant hotheads who put revenge and hatred over chaos worshipping. In addition, Fatuva explicitly told him that Rob out Gilliman had to survive the campaign on Kalth, which would cause him to become paranoid and doubtful and therefore start summoning his forces to Macrag to create Imperium Secundus which would starve terror of resources and possibly swing the war in the direction of Horus. Killing Gilliman would mean that the Separatists would never get that chance, so Lorga had to make a choice between slaying his most hated brother, or sparing him for a shot at something greater. 
by the way, in the Horus Heresy novels it's seen he actually cared a lot for all of his brothers and tried to befriend them. Closest to him among his brothers was perhaps Magnus, which is more than you can say about some loyalist primarchs. Though with different approaches, they were both more scholars than warriors, with lifelong pursuit of knowledge and enlightenment. And both felt more or less distance from others due to their interests and ideologies. So it's natural that the religious preacher and a philosopher king saw kindred spirits in each other. He was also pretty much the only one who cared about Angron in some way and actually ran the ritual which transformed Angron into a demon prince, thus freeing him of the butcher's nails and premature death. He even seems to be good friends with Lemon Russ, referenced in Betrayer given that Russ read something Olga wrote and thought that was some spiritual shit worth remembering, which is pretty significant considering how down to earth this guy was. Also in the first heretic, Magnus tells Lorga that Russ argued for preserving Lorga's place in the crusade and sparing him excommunication when the Emps was pondering kicking Lorga to the curb. More significantly, when Lorga asked Russ and Magnus to stop fighting, they actually listened. The two Primarchs who just might have had the most mutual hatred stopped fighting because Lorga asked them to. And with this comes another major topic with Lorga. Emperor was generally unsatisfied with the slow rate of reclamation by the word bearers and due to this regarded him as one of the most inefficient primarchs. However, this may rather show how incredibly moronic the emperor could be in his judgment. Yes, Lorga wasn't as fast in conquests as his brethren. However, there are these factors to be considered. Lorga rarely even engaged in combat. Most of the reclaimed planets were won by word and faith, rather than fire and sword. Consequently from the first one, planets under Lorga were not been left as ruined, terrorized, butchered, desolate shitholes, and newly acquired, intact planets would start giving immediate benefits to the Imperium. In fact, alongside Dawn and Gilliman, Lorga was one of the rarer conquerors who left the conquered place in better state than before the conquest. One of the main reasons for the slow rate of reclamation by Lorga was because he spent large amount of time spreading his ideology among local population. Due to his charisma and religious zeal, he would convince the population of the benefits of imperial rule, how great and mighty humans would be when they would rule the entire galaxy and so on, to the point that the citizens would become fiercely loyal to the imperium, rendering a rebellion practically impossible. The Emperor made him and his legion for this specialization, judging from the fact the Emperor created ever faceted Lorga's being and from how the Imperial Heralds functioned prior to joining their Primarch. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Now, with these factors in mind, a reasonable ruler who is not headachingly retarded, once he would find out what kind of person he was dealing with, would perhaps simply relieve him from his military duties, and instead would appoint him as head of the imperial propaganda or diplomatic apparatus, where his talents would be used at maximum efficiency. Angron or Mortarian might have been able to make war more effectively, but only Horus was Lorga's equal in diplomacy. Even when grudging with his brothers he was quite diplomatic, and he sincerely believed he could eventually convince everyone else about his point of view on the Emperor's divinity. He was also terrifyingly powerful sicker, but refused to use his gift for the same reasons. He ceased this emo shit after falling to chaos, turning into a badass sorcerer able to rival Magnus, or at least Magnus's psychic projection, which is still far beyond any 40k level monster sicker capabilities. In fact he was the third or fourth most powerful, once Imperial, sicker in the galaxy, second to only Big E, Magnus and maybe Malkada. A couple of demons and a certain dick might give him a run for his money as well if you consider non-humans. He also bore the greatest physical similarity to the Emperor, under his golden tattoos he looked exactly like a younger version of Big E's true form, yeah, yeah, 
Dark Emperor told Korax that he had no true form, but then he also said that demons were minor Xenos pests, so figure that out yourself. He has also dabbled in trolling shown in one scene in No No Fear, where he's pretty much blatantly trolling Gilliman. Lorga, have you lost your temper, Rob out? Gilliman, I am going to gut you. Lorga, you have lost your temper. Take that bitch. His actions during the heresy mainly consisted of keeping Engren on a slaughter path as well as saving his life. He repeatedly tried to get Magnus to join the traitors but realized that he was totally out of his depth in terms of warpcraft. Unfortunately, Lorgar turned out to be closer in mentality to Erebus than he would ever like to admit. When Horus was elevated by the gods on Moloch, Lorgar grew frustrated about how Horus would not submit to chaos and received a vision of his leadership leading to their defeat on Terra. When Horus was wounded by the Emperor's spear, Lorga sensed the opportunity to usurp him as War Master as well as High Priest of Arch Chaos. Suffice to say that it did not go to plan and a revived Horus curb stomped him publicly in front of the entire mass traitor forces on Alana. He would have killed Lorga but relented at the last minute, banishing him from his court and telling him that Lorga would die if Horus ever saw him again which turned out to be moot later but partly explained why Lorga isolated himself from his brothers afterwards. A small portion of 5,000 word bearers, led by Zadu Layak, swore themselves to Horus at that point and Lorga warned the War Master that his refusal to submit to the Chaos Gods would lead to the traitor's defeat. One can only assume that following Horus' death that there was a lot of smug I told you so I'm on Lorga's end. Post Heresy. So now he's the demon primarch of the word bearers, the guys who make the rest of the chaos space marines look like all around swell secular humanist types. They're kind of like Jehovah's Witnesses, except instead of knocking on your door and telling you about Jesus they knock down your door and ask you which end of a demon summoning you want to be on. This tends to make chaos otherwise awful selling pitch seem oddly compelling. He also has a particular hatred for atheists, so he loathes his atheist daddy emperor and the weeaboo space communists more than he hates everything else. In a supreme twist of irony, the Echelshiarchy of the Imperium, which is the primary target for the word bearers during conquest, derives most if not all of their religious texts from Lorga. That bible they administer to citizens daily? The prayers quadrillions of soldiers and civilians utter daily in an effort to believe? That devotion to the emperor? All fostered and nurtured by Lorga. All brought about by him and his legion's sheer devotion. And all that shit works. Grey knights are protected from demons by their faith while the latter fear holy water blessed by the Echelshiarchy. Sisters of battle pull out miracles and have a freaking living saint. S. Resurrected by the emperor. ETC. Leading to countless jokes about it being Lorga's plan all along. In short, Lorga is responsible for both the heresy that marked the end of the Imperium's golden age and the only thing that would save humanity in its long evolution to a fully psychic race. That being said, Lorga is actually so ashamed of the Lictitia Divinitatus, the primary holy book of the Imperium he wrote, that bringing it up is a surefire way to have your body and soul obliterated in such horrific ways that no words exist in the myriad tongues of the universe to fully encompass the unholy rape you would receive. Seriously, just don't. Now just imagine his face when he hears that Gorillaman himself is slowly becoming convinced of the Emperor's divinity and is reading a copy of the Lictitio Divinitatus with Lorga's autograph. Since the heresy, Lorga's notable achievements consist of becoming a demon prince of chaos undivided, and, yes, that is technically possible, and it was also the standard before GW decided to retcon, before doing sweet fuck all for several millennia. Seriously. Magnus might have spent most of the last 10,000 years sitting in his tower screaming just as planned at the top of his lungs whenever he pours milk over his demon cereal but at least he actually got off his red ass and led the thousand suns to wreck the space wolves shit on their own home planet. Twice. Comma Lorga, though? The lazy fuckwit has just been holed up on Sycorus meditating and traversing the warp secretly crying and weeping in guilt for what he has done quote unquote by our spiritual liege himself, Robert Derpyman. Congratulations, chaos gods, you have created the Lovecraftian equivalent of that unemployed arsehole friend who won't get off your couch and who is secretly emo. If you believe Magnus, 
Lorga has already achieved what the Chaos Gods wanted by setting up this stalemate between Chaos and the Imperium so he's entitled to some well-earned ruminating on scripture, but fuck that because it's boring. Also because it runs totally counter to the beliefs that Lorga developed during the first Heretic, which are all about mankind embracing Chaos and everyone becoming willingly possessed like his gal Vorbach. Apparently he was actually working on some new demon summoning techniques, which he taught Abaddon before the 13th Black Crusade. Which on the whole... is pathetic, that's like something they should be doing on their off hours when not busy slaughtering Imperial worlds. Given that Abaddon's the only other big player on the Chaos side who's still devoted to toppling the Imperium in the name of Chaos Undivided, you'd think Logger would be beside him every step of the way. The prevailing theory is that he's busy indulging Slanesh's church boy fantasies contemplating the mysteries of chaos. Although if you want to be logical, if logic could be applied to chaos or 40k in general, him being the demon prince of chaos undivided means that he must execute the will of chaos undivided, which is, incidentally, divided, and as such, he can't do shit. Or he, being essentially a spiritual entity, doesn't need to be physically present to guide Abaddon. As of M42 where shit has most definitely hit the fan in the form of the Great Rift splitting the galaxy in half, Lorga has apparently been seen leading the word bearers on their unholy crusades. So looks like he's finally gotten off his lazy ass. However Corvus Corax is now consumed by the singular purpose of getting revenge on his traitorous brothers. Korax descended on Lorga and spoiled his otherwise magnificent appearance after 10,000 years busy doing fucking nothing. Surprisingly the balance of power did not change between the two, and Lorga, again, ran for his life, as his original backup seemed to be too busy being dead to help him again. As of now, it has been reported that he has locked himself back in his tower on Sycorus, rocking back and forth on the floor and yelping every time a bird comes near his window. Poor Lorga? Pre-Retskin? Of course. Even though he had to have known he was breaking the Imperial truth it's not like any of his actions were to the detriment of the Imperium. If you don't know why you can re-read the sections above. But that wasn't edgy enough, so GW swooped in with retcons. Post retcon? Not so much. While Lorga still peacefully brought worlds into fanatical compliance, he also had no issue committing atrocities against worlds which refused Lorga's religion. It's not like Lorga was any more heavy handed than his more militarily efficient brothers, but at this point he was also doing the very things the Imperial Truth was made to prevent in the first place. The Red can also, clearly, add that Lorga received multiple warnings by Big E prior to Menachia to change course. Lorga would ignore much more explicit instructions for a century before Big E's hand was forced at Menachia. Of course, that doesn't mean that Big E couldn't have handled Menatia much differently, or that the Imperial Truth was actually a sensible plan. Lorga basically drank his own Kool-Aid and would suffer the consequences of not following basic instructions, likely because a highly religious Primarch will not turn atheist if you tell him to. Lorga would go from doing the Emperor's bidding to the bidding of entities known for destruction, degeneracy, disease, and deception. Even worse. He did so even after being shown what would happen if he followed said entities. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.